The following is a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. This morning I ask you the question, what if? What if? These two words have been followed by imaginative speculation that has taken us all kinds of directions. In the privacy of our moments as we imagine different scenarios by which life could have unfolded. What if I had not been married? What if I had been married? What if I had these children? I didn't have these children. What if I took this college career class versus this college career class? What if I chose this occupation? What if I lived in this state? What if this person I had never met instead met somebody else? And on and on it goes in a personal labyrinth of mental exercises to speculate what life would be like if but there was but a deviation, a small alteration of decision-making, a circumstance that had come out a different way than we otherwise have seen it come out. Well, this has been true in the imaginative historical minds of writers as they've thought back and reflected on history. What if we took the parts of history that we knew and we organized them differently with a different turn of events? How would life look then? What if the South won the Civil War? The effect would be that America would still become one nation again, arguably by the year 1960. In 1960, an article authored by a Civil War buff, McInlay Cantor, envisioned a history in which the Confederate forces won the Civil War in 1863, forcing the despised President Lincoln into exile. He then went on to describe how the Southern forces would annex Washington, D.C., renaming it the District of Dixie. The United States would move its capital to Columbus, Ohio, but could no longer afford to buy Alaska from the Russians. Texas would be unhappy with this new arrangement and would declare its independence in 1878. And under international pressure, the Southern states would still gradually abolish slavery. But only after fighting together in two world wars, the three nations are reunified in 1960, a century after South Carolina secession had led to the Civil War in the first place. What if? What if Hitler successfully invaded Russia during World War II? The effect would be that Hitler would be thought of in history as a revered great leader in military strategy. Historians have speculated what it would have been like if Nazi Germany had successfully invaded Russia in 1942. Learning that Britain had broken the Enigma Code, the Nazis would have to play it safe and make peace with the West. Through the, mu the magic of propaganda, Hitler would be respected 20 years later as a beloved leader. It's an alternate history, of course, but historians draw a parallel story by which they support this claim. Stalin's Russia. For did not Stalin kill millions of people and yet ironically be admired for this great military leader? What if the Cuban Missile Crisis escalated into full-scale war? Some have said it would be the end of nuclear proliferation except in the United States. In 1999, Brendan Dubois in Resurrection Day, imagine a history where the United States military sabotages President Kennedy's attempts to negotiate peace during the Cuban Missile Crisis. The United States instead invades Cuba, making the crisis escalate into nuclear warfare. The Soviet Union is destroyed, the People's Republic of China collapses, and a fallout cloud over Asia kills millions of other people. Meanwhile, the New United States would lose New York, Washington, D.C., San Diego, Miami, and other cities. However, all the surviving nations would renounce their possession of nuclear weapons with the exception of the United States, which would then be now under martial law, as the military had planned all along. Now, these are events in history that have been altered by the historical imagination based upon other considerations. What if? What if scenarios seem wildly imaginative while others are indeed based on historical curiosity? Well, there is one what if that the Bible talks about. A what if scenario that causes one to consider. 
a number of factors. And it's one that we've already had read to us in 1 Corinthians 15 this morning. What if? What if? In 1 Corinthians 15, just by way of introduction, to consider what if Christ was not raised from the dead. In fact, in verse 13 and later again in verse 16, he essentially works from the lesser to the greater. He says, what if there was no resurrection of the dead? Well, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then there could be no Christ being raised from the dead. And if there's no Christ being raised from the dead, he has a series of consequences and implications. Preaching would be in vain. Why am I here? What am I talking to you about? What's the point of this? Religious fables? More of it? Please. We would have been lying about God as we told people He is powerful. He can do anything. If you'll give your life to Him, you'll be amazed at how He can transform and change it and what He's promising to do. He's powerful enough to create, but He's not, unfortunately, powerful enough to be raised from the dead. He's still in the tomb. You would have no hope for your sinful condition because, after all, the payment that was made by Christ on the cross was apparently not enough. He's still in the tomb. For those of our family members who had claimed to be Christians through their faith in Christ, if those who have already died, if they put their faith in Christ, well, bad news, Paul says, there actually would be in hell. There would be no eternal salvation. Our faith would be in vain. All of our services, activities, hopes, desires would end in vanity and meaningless, and we ultimately should be pitied. And we should not be here this morning. But that's actually not what happens. Because the real story tells us what happens. And I want us to see how pivotal that empty tomb is for life. To do that, I want to ask you to open your Bibles to 1 Peter. For those of you who don't have a copy of the Bible, you're welcome just to listen as I read it to you. We give those available to you for free. We always like to make them available each and every Sunday at the back in the lobby at the Welcome Center. Just say, hey, can I get one of those free Bibles? Accurate, readable translations. It's the identical Bible that I have in my hand right here. For you to be able to read that and understand that. In the meantime, you could just listen with us this morning as we work our way through a few verses in 1 Peter. 1 Peter is found at the very end of the Bible, just before Revelation and Jude and the epistles of John. You have 1 and 2 Peter. It's written by one of the followers of Jesus, Peter himself. He was known as one of the disciples, really a, a leader amongst equals, if you will. There were 12 disciples. Peter's often recorded as having these conversations with Jesus, with Jesus on behalf of the others, often putting his foot in his mouth many a times. Well, it's only after the crucifixion and resurrection and the appearance that it clicks, all of it clicks for Peter. And Peter begins to write, he begins to minister, and the book of Acts teaches this and how he understood and how he grew in his understanding of the gospel. And this is such an account here that Peter is now writing himself to other Christians, other Christians who have been persecuted, who have scattered, who are no longer living in their hometowns, no longer next to their child neighborhood friends and family, but they're scattered. And he says here in verse 3 through verse 5 the following, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Let's stop there. The title of this morning's message is Empty Tomb. The Empty Tomb, a linchpin of the Christian's faith and future. And we see this here in 1 Peter as we understand the significance of the resurrection. If you will, just look back at verse 3, because the very beginning words set up what is now about to follow. Really not just stopping at verse 5, but for our purposes this morning, we stop at verse 5. He says, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. What he's first of all saying here, just by commendation, really by commandment, he's saying, hey, praise be to God. 
He's saying, praise God. He wants them to understand this is a response. Now, honestly, initially, this might seem like a rather insensitive writer, not the kind of guy you want to bring to you in your time of suffering. You know, they have those people who sometimes, like, it's somehow going well for them, but it's not going well for you, and somehow they somehow talk to you like it's going well for you, and you're like, dude, are you, like, denying reality? Peter initially might think like he's denying reality. Peter, you've just said yourself here in verse 1 that you're writing to people who are the elect exiles of the dispersion. He's talking about Christians who have been scattered, Christians who are going through great suffering, which he's going to pick up here in verses 6 and following as well. But Peter, from the very beginning, teaches a perspective that everybody should realize, and that is this. Our joy should not be, our contentment should not be based in our earthly circumstances. That's actually not where he tells us to look. He says there, blessed be, praise be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This theme of praise and rejoicing continues. You look at verse 6. He says, in this you rejoice. He goes on to speak again about this idea of verse 8, about who you love, that you believe in. And again in verse 8, that you rejoice with joy. He has this perspective that's almost like he is living in some alternate universe, as if he's living in denial. Friends, he's not living in denial. He's actually looking above the circumstances that seemingly can cloud each and every one of our vision. And he says here in the very beginning, praise be to God. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting to note here, God is to be blessed or praised because of the salvation he has given to believers. Blessing God or praising God is, is rooted in this Old Testament imagery that Peter would have been very familiar with as a Jewish person himself. The blessing begins the section here with joy, with gladness, as it fills and kind of saturates the rest of the passage. And he is saying here, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because what he's talking about is that we know from the Gospel of John, for example, that the Father commands the Son and the Son obeys in John 5. The Father sends the Son and the Son goes to do the Father's will. And yet this is not because there's a lessening of dignity with the Son as if he's any less God. Peter is rightly acknowledging here, Praise be to God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, why should we praise God? Why should we praise God? Well, verse 3 tells us, He has saved us from our sins. Saved us from our sins. Look at what it says there in continuing in verse 3. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Now, this idea here of causing us to be born again, staying in chapter 1, jump ahead to verse 23. He says, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding Word of God. Today in, um, in America, you'll have people try to differentiate themselves from others who claim that they're Christians, if they too believe they're Christians. And so sometimes you get in this expression when people say, are you a Christian? I'm a Christian. You're like, oh, okay, everybody says they're a Christian in America, it feels like. A lot of the world thinks like the whole country of America is Christian. That's clearly not true, but nevertheless, it's like the default religion of choice to claim in America. And so then you'll have some people claim like, oh, yeah, well, I'm a Christian. Well, I'm a born-again Christian. You're like, oh, well, checkmate on that one. And others would be like, you know what, I'm not a born again Christian, that, that can be confusing. I'm, I'm a Christ follower. You're like, wait, sorry, you're a Christian, you're a Christ follower? And you're like, yes. Like, I am so confused. Who are we even talking about anymore? But the idea here is an a common kind of Bible talk. We're trying to differentiate what do we really mean when someone self-identifies as a Christian. And one of those terms used is that term being born again. And it's not uncommon today that that term being born again is something that it's said a Christian happens to them after they've put their faith in Christ. Like, friend, listen, here's how this works. It's like this transactional experience. You are going to put your faith in Christ, and if you do that, He will then have you be born again. That's actually not at all what we see here in the text. If you look here in the text, back in verse 23, it says, since you have been born again, it says passive tense, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable 
And how are you born again? Through the living and abiding Word of God. This is what Paul says in Romans chapter 10 when he says, faith comes by hearing the Word of Christ. In other words, no one can become a Christian apart from the goodness of God shown in the Scriptures. You can't go outside and like stare at the stars. You can't contemplate your navel. You just can't kind of think your way into salvation through any other means. The only way that you can do this is through the knowledge of the Word of God. And so what, what Peter is saying here is that how this happens is through the Scriptures. We go back to verse 3. Look at verse 3. He has caused us to be born again. The focus is on God's initiative in producing new life. How have you ever seen, when have you ever seen someone who has said they picked their birth date? Anybody here pick your birth date? I mean, I, I have a birth date of June 1st. And quite honestly, I'm thankful for it. It's like the most awesome day in the year. My March 1st, which is my wife's birthday. No, but in all sincerity, June 1st is not a day I got to pick. It was a day somebody else picked. And quite honestly... My mom and dad didn't even pick it. That's when it was like time to be born. God said, it's time. Here I come. No one ever claims credit for the day of their birth. Yet what's so interesting is a lot of Christians will take credit for the day of their spiritual birth. But we see here in the text, God has caused us to be born again. To do this in such a way that it gives glory to God. Now, why would God do this? Well, it says that in verse 1, according to his great mercy. According to his great mercy. You know what this reminds me of? You don't have to turn there. I'll turn there for you. In Ephesians chapter 2, when it's describing salvation of sinners, it says in verse 1, you are dead in your trespasses and sins. And then it says in verse 4, but God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses and sins, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Oh, what amazing love this is. And so then look at what he says there. He says, it's according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to what? To a living hope. A living hope. Hope, by definition, is, is confident optimism. Confident optimism. As Christians, we should be known for this. We should be known for this confident optimism. Not naive optimism. No, it's confident optimism. This hope that we read about here in the Bible comes from God, is a gift of grace, is defined by Scripture, is a reasonable reality, is confirmed in the Christian by the Holy Spirit, defends the Christian against Satan's attacks, is confirmed through trials, produces joy, is fulfilled in Christ's return, and then here's the key, verse 3, is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from God the dead. Uh, my boys and I for years have had a family lawn business where mow the lawns in the neighborhood, and uh, it's been something that we've been doing for a number of years, and we have a trailer that has lawn equipment, and on that trailer for years, it's, we've had a zero-turn mower, we've got a riding mower, we've got three push mowers, we've got weed whackers and blowers. I mean, we're legitimate. It's a big trailer. It's weighted down. And the way this thing is weighted is just actually perfectly on this one giant axle with these two tires because we can actually move it around just nicely in the trailer just by lift up. And we feel like we're like total studs lifting this trailer up. But we attach it onto this classic car that I drive around called a Honda Element. It's classic because they don't make them anymore. And every year when we store this thing, we store this at a friend's barn that we store it in through the winter time, and then we have to go get it out, clean up, and get it ready for the upcoming season. So that's very few times in the year that we're actually driving the trailer with all the lawn equipment out of the neighborhood, because we just kind of stay in our neighborhood. But whenever we drive to put it in storage or to take it out of storage, it is like a nerve-wracking experience. Because, honestly, as cool as a Honda Element is, it's not like a Ford Dually truck, right? It's just got like, you know, a quarter, a three-quarter ton axle. It's more of a refinement vehicle, if you will, with V2 motor in it. 
Secondly, we've got this giant chair with tons of equipment. Tons of equipment on it. And then thirdly, the problem is, when you come into spring, all our roads are still trash from all the winter potholes. And we're driving along, and I'm telling you, it's not like you can, like, with your car, like, turn and, like, swing, like, it's this obstacle course, right? Because you do that, that trail is just going to, like, start just spinning around like crazy. So I'm like, you praying, dear Lord, please get us there safely. All mowers included. I don't want any mowers falling off. I don't want any cars going and flipping over. Just get us there safely. But what's crazy is this whole time, you can hear the trailer. It's, it's stuck on top of this trailer hitch ball, and it keeps trying to pull it, right? It's just like, boom. You can just hear it, just, just pulling against it. And the whole time I'm like praying, let the ball hold, let the ball hold, let the ball hold. But really what I'm praying for, this entire system is dependent upon one single small piece of metal that's stuck in the small hole that holds that trailer locked down onto that ball. And if that pin goes, game over. We are cooked. I'm praying, God, let the pin hold. It is the linchpin that holds this whole thing together. Peter says here, the linchpin for the Christian's faith and future is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. The, the confidence of being born again, the confidence of this living hope the confidence of this future inheritance which we haven't gotten to in verse 4, the whole thing is dependent upon the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is the pin. And for you, it might just seem like these passing words and a giant list of words here. I mean, quite honestly, when you read these verses, just 3 through 5, you're like, wow, that's a mouthful. And right in the middle of that is through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because what Peter's acknowledging here is if Christ has not raised from the dead, we're all cooked. Total tragedy. Tremendous amount of perilous consequences. But the pin holds. It's linked together. It is this chain of God's redemptive work. And so we see that here in the text of why we praise God, because he has saved us from our sins. The second reason we praise God is because he has secured our salvation. Look at verse 4. To inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, kept in heaven for you. Peter's selecting this language of inheritance here in the text to describe what's in store for Christians. In the Old Testament land, when they thought of inheritance that God promised to his people was geographic in its understanding. The word is especially common for Joshua, for the appointment of the land, for the appointment of it, rather, as it gets delegated to people as they receive their inheritance for each tribe and family. Peter understands that. In fact, so much of Peter is picking up on this Old Testament imagery for example, in chapter 2, verse 9, you are this chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. He's describing this as Christians. Well, similarly here, when he talks about inheritance, he's talking about something much more significant than just physical. He understood the term, but not in terms of promised land specifically in its geographical place. It's so much more than that. The hope is physical, but we learn from 2 Peter that it's going to be realized in a new heaven and new earth. It transcends and leaves behind the land of Palestine. Paul's view of the inheritance was similar to Peter's, for the inheritance is a sort of future hope of believers in Galatians 3 and Ephesians 1. Even the author of Hebrews is communicating a similar idea, saying that the patriarchs ultimately hoped for a heavenly country and a heavenly city in Hebrews 11. We see here in the New Testament this language of inheriting a kingdom is another way of saying believers will receive eternal life. So we're praising God because he's secured our salvation. But, but notice if you look at verse 4, this inheritance. It's inheritance that's spoken about, that's often misunderstood as being future. Future reality. That will come out even more here in verse 5, but just this promise of what he's saying is to come. Peter's point here is that we are all sojourners and aliens in the world. 
we, we face tragedy now. See, I think that's the challenge is that we want something now. We want an inheritance now. We want to be like the prodigal son who cashes in on it now. It's what the theologians call over-realized eschatology. In other words, the things that are promised in the future, we want that now. And Peter's like, listen, listen, what God has for you in the future is far better than anything you could have now. Far more grander, more magnificent. Notice how this inheritance is described. It can never perish, never be defiled, be corrupted as the translation would be. It's unfading. It, it doesn't fall off. It's permanent. Look at that word there again, kept. Who does all the work here? Verse 3, who's causing us to be born again? God. Who's keeping the inheritance in verse 4? God. Oh, I'm so glad our investment is there. I'm so glad he holds our stock. I'm so glad that's where the portfolio of our life is invested, that he is managing our assets, the confidence we can have there. Most of us have heard of Fort Knox, the United States Bullion Depository. It's one of the most secure banks in the world. Solid granite wall perimeter, dozens of guards, armed military, a 22-ton door that closes the vault. In addition to that, the lock is so intricate, it requires 10 people to unlock it, a 10-person team. Even more significant than that, though, based on the holdings, is the New York Federal Reserve Vault, the world's biggest gold depository. Not out in the middle of Kentucky, but actually right under the streets of Manhattan, sits a vault so impenetrable that it's entrusted with more United States gold bullion than Fort Knox has. Security is so tight that men aren't even allowed to enter into the vault. Pallets are moved around by a team of robots. The bank's security systems are so trusted that even foreign governments use it for their storage of their gold. And as if that wasn't enough, there's a supreme level of protection force around the perimeter with these armed guards that their shooting range scores are so good, they're better than marksman classification. I don't know what that means, except I just take it that means they're a boss. And yet these secure places have nothing on the kind of security that God's talking about here in verse 4, kept in heaven for you. Christians, the salvation that God gives is not a salvation that can be taken away by somebody else. Not a salvation you can lose like you lose your keys or your wallet. It's not a salvation that Satan can come and snatch away. It's a salvation that is as secure as heaven is itself. God does that. We praise God because he has saved us from our sins. We praise God because he has secured our salvation. And we praise God because he has promised us a future. Look at verse 5. Who, by God's power, who is the who here? You, us. He has caused us to be born again. It says there, verse 4, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. The living hope of believers, according to verse 4, is their inheritance. And verse 4 emphasizes that the inheritance is imperishable, beautiful, and reserved. But now in verse 5, Peter wants the readers to consider when they will confidently receive it. Notice how he uses the term here in verse 5, for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Salvation is often talked about in the Bible a number of different ways by different authors. And Peter is describing here as salvation is being rescued from God's judgment or his wrath on that last day. Sometimes in popular circles today, salvation is used to conceive of as a, as a past action. 
I received salvation, or a present circumstance, I have salvation. And again, Scripture speaks about the perspective in that, particularly in the Gospel of John, it talks about how we have eternal life now. But Peter, and very commonly a lot of other writings in the, in the New Testament, describes salvation as a future glory that believers will enjoy. And it's clear that that's how Peter conceived of it in future terms. But look at how it's described here. It's described as guarded through faith. Now, this is interesting because you're, you're wondering, well, God's doing all the work. Whose faith is this? Friend, it's, it's your faith. It's your faith. It's your faith in that it's not somebody else's faith for you. It's not your parents' faith. It's not your spouse's faith. It's, it's not God's faith. It's, it's your faith. So this idea of how it's guarded through faith needs a little bit of explanation here. It's this idea here of guarded is this military term Peter's using. It's like putting garrisons of soldiers around something to protect it. Putting a bunch of armed guards around something saying, you cannot pass through here without getting by us, and you're not going to get by us. It's, just, it's imagery he's using here, and this military understanding is how it's being guarded. But we can see from the following verses, he does not, here's the key, he does not exempt Christians from persecution or suffering. So this idea of being guarded is not we guard you from tragedy. That's sometimes one of the, the most misrepresented parts of the evangelistic conversation with non-Christian. And if you're not a Christian, let me just clarify this for you right now. When Christians tell you about hope found in Christ, they genuinely mean that. Sometimes they overstate that, almost in kind of a naive but optimistic way, that if you come to Jesus, everything's better. Everything's better. And just fill in the blank what everything is. Money, you get more of it. Health, you get stronger. Friends, you get even more of them. Uh, you know, job promotion, you can't wait to see it coming. And that kind of idea, everything's going to be better. And the problem comes... There's like this false advertising because then people give their life to Christ and they're like really disoriented. Like, this is not what I expected. I have a good friend of mine after he gave his faith to Christ about five years ago, after he came to faith in Christ, guess what happened? He got cancer. Hey, is there like a warranty on this salvation? Can I, is there an exchange policy? Can I turn this back in? Because I, I wasn't expecting cancer. Friends, Peter's not naive here. He says in verse 6, In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials. Why? Verse 7, So that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. See, friends, for those of you who are not Christians, I, I want to honestly put before you the hope found in Christ. And then honest putting it before you is this. There is no other way by which man, you or I, can be reconciled to God who created us who continues to sustain us, who provides for all of us, whether or not we acknowledge him or thank him or in any ways, you know, give a shout out to the big man in the sky and however we might think of him, that the only way we can be reconciled to him because of how significant our sin is against him, small or great in our own thinking, but big in his understanding, based his holiness, is through faith in his son. Where we turn from our sins and put our faith in Jesus Christ that only he is perfect like we have never been. Only he perfectly obeyed all of God's law like we never have, not just seen in his teachings, but in his life. And that then he received upon himself the punishment that we deserve by dying on the cross as a substitute for all those that would believe in him and then be buried physically in the tomb and then three days later raised from the grave appearing to over 500 witnesses that all those who would believe in him would be saved. There is no other name given under heaven by which men can be saved. But friends, here's the key. That does not mean that God somehow intends to spoil you and give you everything your heart now wants 
now that you give your life to Christ. We would think a parent who did that with a child, with every request a child made now of their parent, now that they knew who their parent was, that every request a child made of their parent would be good and right. Every candy they wanted, every, every fun thing they wanted, every possession that they wanted to inherit, everything they asked of, that every parent who gave that to the kid, we would not think of that as a good parent, would we? No more do we think of God being a good God who would give that to his children. But instead, he gives to them what is good and right for their purposes of growing in Christ-likeness, for his glory, but with this confidence assurance in verse 5 guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. This final inheritance does not bypass human beings as if we are mere machines in the process. Believers must exercise faith, not just faith to begin their walk with Christ, but faith to continue in their walk with Christ. It's a continuing trust or faithfulness is the word being used here. Peter did not conceive of faith as a single isolated act. He understood that genuine faith, faith that originates with God having caused the person to be born again, that genuine faith will continue. Does not mean it's never faltering. Does not ever believe it's ever fully mature all the time. It instead can be weak, can be light, but nevertheless still present. And there is no final salvation apart from continued faith. This is the condition for that obtaining of that future inheritance. So, friend, I ask you, where is your faith? Not where has it been. Where is it now? If it's in Christ, there's hope. Oh, there's so much hope. But if it's not, there's great cause for concern. When an event takes place in history, there are enough people alive who were eyewitnesses of it or had participated in the event that when the information is published about that event, one is able to verify the validity of a historical event. We have records of your birth. Eyewitnesses were present when you came into the world. Documentation has been made that supports that you exist, even if you're not physically present with us. William Lyon Phelps, for more than 40 years, was a Yale's distinguished professor of English literature, author of some 20 volumes of literary studies, and a public speaker at Yale, and he said the following. In the whole story of Jesus Christ, the most important event is the resurrection. Christian faith depends on this. It is encouraging to know that it is explicitly given by all four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and told also by Paul. The names of those who saw him after his triumph over death are recorded. And it may be said that the historical evidence for the resurrection is stronger than any other miracle anywhere narrated. For as Paul said, if Christ is not risen from the dead, then, our preaching in, then, then is our preaching in vain, and your faith is also in vain. But here's the kicker. It's not in vain because the tomb is empty. It is assured. It is a confident hope. And so we praise God because he saved us from our sins. He secured us our salvation, and he's promised us a future. Having provided the proof in the empty tomb, having given us a promised permanent inheritance, and show us the power of our salvation being kept secure, we can praise God confidently. Let's do that now together. This has been a presentation of Castleview Baptist Church in Indianapolis, Indiana. For more information about our church or our senior pastor, Eric Bancroft, please click on the link below or visit castleview.org.